So we'll move on to our next speaker, um, who is Dave Armstrong from uh, the University of Warwick, who's going to tell us about machine learning for exoplanet detection. Right. Thanks, Ross, for inviting me to, the, for inviting me to this lovely town. Um, I'm going to start off with the astronomy side of things today. Um, but I will split that up into a few things. So given we're from quite a wide, diverse range of backgrounds here, I'm going to start by explaining how we detect exoplanets and a little bit about the background of the field. So we're going through two different case studies of trying to use machine learning to help that process speed it up and generally prepare ourselves for the very large quantities of data that are going to come about very soon. So this is the histogram of exoplanet detections going back about 20 years. You can see that back in 2000, if we take it back to over here, there were almost none. Five years before that, absolutely none. And over the last five, ten years, it's skyrocketed. Up till now, we have about 3,500 confirmed planets that are known. The different colors are different ways we use to detect them. And you can see the big green bars dominate that. And that's thanks to something called the Kepler satellite. I'll turn up to later. So this is a field that's been growing very big re very recently. And it's kind of outpacing our ability to just deal with it on an individual by eye astronomer basis. As those planets have changed, we've started detecting smaller and smaller, harder and harder planets. So the first ones we found are all these things up here, which are basically Jupiter size, orbiting very close to their host stars. So they orbit the star in maybe a few days, known as hot Jupiters. They're the easiest ones to find because we see the signal changing very rapidly. They're big like Jupiter, so they give big signals in comparison to the star, and that helps everything. As time went on, we managed to progress down in this kind of right direction until we get this big blob here, which is from that Kepler satellite I mentioned. Now, these uh, smaller planets, more distant planets, and hence cooler planets, and we start to get towards things like the Earth, which is there on the plot. You might note that we still haven't got there. You'll see in the press a lot of articles talking about Earth 2.0 and how we've detected a second Earth. We have never quite got to it yet. We found planets the same size as the Earth. We found planets the same temperature as the Earth. But we've never found something that orbits a star like the Sun that's the Earth's size on an Earth-like orbit. It's coming soon. You can kind of see from this scatter slowly moving their way down that way, but not yet. Now, if I go back to that plot, I pointed out the green bars. This is something called the transit method, and it's what I'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk, because it's firstly the um, dominant method that we've used to find planets, and secondly, the one I work with most. So, you know, you have to stick with what you know. The transiting method works by, as a planet orbits a star, following this gray line here, if the alignment of the orbit is particularly good for us, it will pass in front of the star and block off some of its light. That means if we're observing the star with very precise telescopes, we can see a dip in the brightness of the star with time. And if that dip repeats itself every time the planet goes around the orbit very regularly, we can start to think that maybe it's a transiting planet. That produces something like this in the data, where we measure the, th the brightness. We see a nice U-shaped thing like this, and then it comes back up, and that repeats. Looking for these is how we do it. To give you some more concrete examples of that, and I'm going to try and play a video, always daring, <laughs> see if it works. Um, this is the transit of Venus observed over our own sun, which is roughly equivalent to a Jupiter-sized planet passing a, a Jupiter-sized exoplanet passing its own star. You can see it going. You can see the sun in various different colors, showing what makes this problem complicated. The stars aren't particularly constant. They're certainly not nice yellow spheres, like I showed you in the last plot. And that's why this gets difficult. But in that case, you can see the planet's quite large, and things generally aren't too hard. Now, if I go towards something more like the Earth, this is a transit of Mercury. Now, can anyone see the planet? Yeah? <laughs> it crosses one of the bright spots. There you won't see. <laughs> if we spot this for anyone still watching. <laughs> This is where the problem gets very difficult, and it's why we haven't really found many things like the Earth yet. Stars are not constant. They vary. They're active. They have all kinds of effects going on, and that complicates everything we know. Now, that's the first level of the problem. The second level is that many other things also look like this. So a planet orbiting a star, like here, shows this characteristic dip. However, a large planet is about the same size as a brown dwarf, which is a very low-mass star. And so you get roughly the same signal. And there are other ways we can use to distinguish between the two, but it complicates the issue. More, more difficult in these days is that stars orbiting other stars also show this dip. They tend to be a little bit different, so you can often tell. But if they're in the background of another star, so if you're observing two and you can't distinguish them on the sky or the pixels of your camera, then you can end up with something that looks almost exactly the same. In this case, with a star orbiting a star, 
the transit, the dip can be very deep, so that tends to tell us something about it. But in this case, it can be about the same depth as a planet, and we end up with another problem. So more practical examples of that will be over here. So this is um, from the K2. It's another satellite data set, but there's no need to go into that here. This is, for example, something we've measured here. This is another one. You can see these. I've, this is the light curve itself, so you see these regular transits coming down. Like this. This is very nice data, I'll point out as well. So this is the nice and easy option. <laughs> and if you fold them across on top of one another, you get something that looks like this. Which is sort of a more realistic version of what I showed you earlier. Now, one of these is a planet, and one of them is two stars. Which one? These are the stars. I can tell you because I know something else about the light curve, but it's quite difficult to say just from this alone. You can note, if you've got eagle eyes here, that there is a very slight shape difference between the two. And that's something we can start to build on, something we start to use. These star one, stellar ones tend to be a bit narrower, and that can give you some clues. But again, it's only one element of the problem. If I go to some slightly more edgy ones, shall we say, um, same satellite, so you can get an idea of how small this is. If that's a real planet, it's probably smaller than the Earth. But this is what that light curve looks like now. No nice characteristic dips going down, just a big blur of points. In this case, they're actually showing relatively white noise, which is quite nice, but they by no means always do that. It's usually much more correlated. And you get a signal here, which is relatively clear, but I mean, there's no hope of trying to tell what shape that is, right, along like the other one. So where do you go from there? In this case, you've got a nicer signal, but if you look at this light curve, all of these things are different depths. Now, that's a really bad sign. Transits don't do that, or at least they shouldn't. But if your detrending algorithm or something you've done to the data can cause that, you don't want to start losing planets just because they look like that. But then again, some other causes can do that. So I'm starting to give you a picture of the various implications and complications that can come out of this process. The way we might do this, or work from this normally, is run some kind of signal detection algorithm. There are various ones out there, but looking for periodic signals. Cut it to some kind of list of planetary candidates, and that has typically been done initially by a lot of astronomers staring at a lot of data. <laughs> And still is done that way, I'll point out. <laughs> and we haven't really worked past it properly. Or a variety of different expert systems, some machine learning algorithms that people have tried that I'll talk about a little bit. Lots of different options. That can lead to a plausible candidate list, at which there's a, another step, in that those candidates can all look like they might be planets, but some of them won't be. And usually we've had to look using spectrographs, try and detect, use other methods to confirm them as real planets. Recently, there's been some other options where people have tried to statistically say whether something's a planet or not without any extra data. And that can be very useful when you have thousands or you have no option of getting that extra data, but it has some weaknesses too. And you have to be very careful about the assumptions that go into those processes. Now, the motivation for trying to apply machine learning to all of this, either in the first step, the second step, or the entire thing, is that so far, I said we've got 3,500 planets down over there. <laughs> Currently, the test satellite was launched about a month ago and is under commissioning and is expected to observe somewhere in the tens of millions of different targets. There are, at least, the, at least according to yield simulations, about 20,000 planets to be expected in the data, mm -hmm. which is you know, a nice order of step up, but it's still not huge compared to some things. Those planets are mixed in around several hundred thousand of these false positives, like binaries that eclipse other signals that might cause it. That doesn't include anything the instrument might do that might look like a planet. So probably there will be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of signals, of which 20,000 will be very interesting planets. This starts to get to the point where looking at all of them ourselves is just impossible. Or if not impossible, you have to hire a lot of PhD students, and it's not really very fair. So with that, I'm going to start going through two um, different case studies about trying to apply this to the problem. The first one is with an instrument based on the ground called NGTS that we run from Warwick. Now, this is a 12 telescope survey sited in Paranel in Chile. Um, I think that's the VLT up on the hill, if anyone's interested. Um, to date, it's taken about 16 million images. We've got many tens of terabytes of data, many, many targets, about 500,000. The characteristics of this data set, which are somewhat analogous to some of those problems that came up in the medical um, community earlier, I think, actually, is that while we have a very large number of candidates, that come out of this. There's 500,000 targets, but you know, over 100,000 candidates, at least after you've cut these and got several candidates per star and so on. A very, very small fraction of those are positives. So out of these 100,000, there's so far, there's about 10 probable planets that we've found. About half of those are published. The others are in the works. You can start to see the imbalance that comes about from this. And that's quite a difficult problem to work with. 
Now, it's very different from the other case study I'll get onto from space, where things tend to be a bit clearer but have their own problems. But we'll start with this one. Now, the way we have found these 10 planets, I won't even say used to, but the way we have found them is, again, by this eyeballing. So we have a team of maybe 30 astronomers. There is a bit of code that will show you these different light curves with maybe a signal in it, a slight zoom of the signal, lots of auxiliary data up the top there, the picture on the camera that we see, um, the periodogram, so what different signal strengths we get at different orbitable periods for the planet. And we'll see something like this. Now, this one is very nice. It's a little bit deep, but it could be a planet subject to further follow-up. This is very clearly not a planet. This is what certain forms of eclipsing binary look like, and so on. Again, we have the nice ones and the less nice ones. So both of these are quite plausibly, say, Neptune-sized planets. You'll note how the signal quality has gone down from those examples I showed you earlier. That's because this is from the ground. It makes things much more hard. But you can take more data, and it's a lot cheaper. So this is what you do. You see both of these have little possible signals hidden in there. You'll also, if you're looking closely, see the scattering of grey points around them, which shows the actual data, most of which isn't even on the plot. So the binning here is remarkably effective, actually, which is part of what this survey was all about. Um, the trouble is that what do you do to go from there to saying this is really a planet? They're very shallow. You can try and take more data from the ground, and that can help, but it doesn't always, um, especially these days. You can try and look into the shape of it, but you don't have that much information on the shape. You can look nearby, say, are there other stars nearby that might be causing the signal and blending with the one that we see? Um, in this case, probably yes. <laughs> You'll note that both of these were flagged as candidates and were later unflagged, which is what that means. <laughs> so there's a lot of time that goes into flagging these, and then everyone gathers and looks at them and tries to decide between them whether we want to spend more time on following it up. And it's all very resource-intensive, both people and, and equipment. So the aim here was to try and take this process and rather than having everyone look at it and us all spend a lot of time, at least standardize things a bit. Firstly, just rank the candidates before we look at them, because that saves a lot of time and fatigue if you start with the good ones at the top. No question. Eventually, to try and identify them all automatically, which is a huge problem and one that hasn't really been solved yet. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In a minute. We started with around 200,000 candidates from about a tenth of the targets observed. So this isn't that we cut several of the targets. This is that only a tenth of them really showed periodic signals that had any chance of being a planet at all and weren't immediately cut. But you can get more than one per candidate, more than one per target, and so you end up with quite a lot of candidates to work with. Um, preliminary cuts on them, which means removing everything that just has the same period on the same star, for example, something that's completely degenerate and has no extra information, takes you down to a much more manageable number. Um, but, like I said, there's maybe 10 planets known in that, and that's not a training set. Even if you want to start to be clever about different options and adaptive learning strategies, it's just not enough. There's nothing you can do. So we turn to something which is either a sin or a blessing, depending on who you talk to, and simulate a lot of planets. <laughs> now, this is difficult. This is something that's quite hard. To, well, we have an advantage in that we know what a planet should look like, so it's actually not that hard to do. The difficulty isn't in simulating them, it's in making sure that the distributions of simulations you use are quite accurate and that that doesn't go wrong. And it's very hard to tell whether you've gone wrong, but you can at least take some steps later. The question then is what do we use to make things work? Which brings me to a bit of an overview of how the field's gone so far. Now, there are one, two, four, six, um, maybe seven papers on machine learning in exoplanets, which given how there are probably 10 to 20 new exoplanet papers a day on archive shows you how small a part of the field that this really is so far. It's growing, but small. Now, these have mostly used um, the original ones were random forests. There's a few options on unsupervised, unlabeled training sets to see if we could get anywhere with that. And there have been a couple of attempts with neural nets, including one very recently. That's basically it so far. The options I'm going to be talking to you about these ones, partially because it's one that I've done myself, um, <laughs> partially because they're very... Um, amenable to adding in extra data. So the neural net options tend to look at these light curves that I showed you with the dips and use them as images and try and perform image classification. And they work very well in certain ways. But there's a lot of other information about the stars that is useful, whether they have nearby neighbors, things like this. And you can build this into neural nets, but it becomes a little bit, um, you keep adding different layers and different hacking inputs, and it becomes awkward. Not to say it doesn't work, but it features quite naturally in a random forest. And that's the way route we went down first because you can extract various attributes from the light curve and you can add in anything else that you feel might be important. But first, this clustering algorithm. So 
one option when you don't really have many um, training set members is to pretend that a training set's not necessary at all and just pile all of your data into an algorithm and seeing if different clusters come out. Unfortunately, that doesn't work when you don't have any positive cases in there, so you still have to use the injections. But we can worry a little bit less about the labels. Now, I said at the start that all of these different examples that we have um, can look like planets, can not look like planets. Sometimes we have to use extra data to tell they're planets. That can get very expensive. So you can either trust those statistical methods I mentioned, where you try and do it all statistically with no extra data, but they have biases. And if you trust them, you're just building those biases into your machine learning model. And that can be a problem too. So without them, we can start to use something like this. Now, clustering helps us to tell and predict how things might work. It's very interpretable, which I'll get to. The type of clustering I'm going to talk about is a self-organizing map, which is, I don't want to get into how they work specifically, but they're quite effective. There are many forms of clustering, and to be honest, they all work very well in different ways, depending on what you want to do. Um, you'll note here that you can use them to cluster almost anything. So here it's been done with RGB colors. This is the classic canonical example for self-organizing maps. And you'll see the different colors have clustered close to each other. The boundaries are periodic, so you can use that as well. You can do this in more than two dimensions, but it becomes very hard to plot on a PowerPoint slide <laughs> or interpret yourself, and that can be quite difficult. Now, these have worked for a variety of things. In astronomy, and I'm going to um, use an example I did here, this is for classifying variable stars using stellar light curves. And you can see that just using this map and the shape of the light curve, which is what it uses, you can start to get different pulsation types, different kinds of variable, different kinds of eclipsing binary, and they separate very well. And this is very useful. On the planets, we do luckily get something similar. So this is using those candidates from NGTS that I talked about. If I plot the, um, all of the actual candidates, which I'm going to take a leap here and say is our training set for false positives. <laughs> Slight twist of uh, logic there, if you'll get it right. But the, the argument is that so, many, so few of them are actually planets that you have enough, you can just pretend that they're all false positives and use that as your training set. You can later purify it slightly more, but the numbers are so overwhelming that actually it doesn't make much difference. Um, and our injected planets here, we end up with a nice little separation. So you've got this region of the map that is very strongly for planets, and this one that's very strongly for not planets. All looks very good and sorted and so on, right? And then the handful of real candidates that turn up down here, you think, ah, here are our real planets. Now, there are problems with that. <laughs> but if you turn this into a statistic, taking, um, because you have a training set in reality here, so labeling each pixel depending on what's in the training set and what, where they fall in it, you can turn this into a number. And if you just use that to classify the two sets, you end up with some pretty good separation going on. So this is about 80% effective if you just use a, a threshold at 0.5 and tell what's on one side and what's on the other. Not bad, to be honest, given that it's quite a narrow part of the data. But there's many other things that are valuable. In this one, we've just... Can I show you a little bit better? Um, probably won't bother going back now. But in this one, we've just used um, the shape of the transit. So when I showed you right at the start, those dips going down, I've narrowed in on that, passed that to the self-organizing map, and that's all it's seen. So just that one shape. Bin down as well to help things, help things flow smoothly in the rather complicated data that can come out. But there are many other things. So the depth of the shape are quite, is quite important. The duration of it compared to the orbital period that it has, among other things. Certain properties about the rest of the light curve. Are there obvious noise sources in it that look the same? Are there some, something called a secondary eclipse, which is when a star pass, um, passes behind the other star, you'll see two rather than one transit on every orbit, and that can tell you that it's probably a star. Various other things. So we want to use them. And for this, we turn to a random forest. This is a, well, I'm not going to explain random forest here, because I imagine most people have seen them before or used them, or can look them up. But the slight twist is that we're using this parameter from the SOM to input into the random forest. So you're using a bit of an ensemble method here, building one on top of the other. But we're also adding various other things. So um, we can fit models to the transit and see how well they do. We can add measures of the noise variability, lots of other things. Um, and as things develop, and some of you will be aware of the Gaia satellite, there are lots of new bits of new information in that that will become very useful and haven't been added yet. <laughs> but there are options. Now, does that work? Did any of you find the robot form in the back? Yes. Anyone? <laughs> there we go. I'll carry on. So you saw the plot before, and things separated quite well. 
All we've done now is add more information. So if it did anything other than get better, it would be quite hard to say. But you can see on this split now with all the candidates and all the injected planets that really we're doing very well. There is still overlap, but not bad. And if you start to measure this with the AUC score area under the curve, precision and recall, you can see that at least in terms of AUC, we're getting up to about 97, 98% here, which looks fantastic, right? I mean, this is really good. We've got, we have got 200,000 candidates and 2% 2 of 200,000 is still a lot to get wrong. So the things aren't as good as you might think. But on the whole, it's nice. And certainly it would save us a lot of time. Even better, um, given that it's a random forest, we have various features. We can measure the importance of those features in the forest. And because we have an injected training set, and this is the other massive benefit of using injected training sets, we can start to look at what biases the model might have. So which members of the training set aren't classified correctly, and are they correlated in any way with something else? So we can pinpoint weaknesses that perhaps don't come out in these scores. Um, if I start with that, we can look at the strength of the signal. Ooh, there we go. Um, so the one on the right is for these injected planets. Um, the x-axis measures the signal-to-noise ratio of the transit, so basically the depth over the average noise of the light curve, measured in one way or another. Um, you can see that for very high signal-to-noise transits, we basically get all of them right. The red line shows the median, and the blue points are all the data. Past the threshold of around 7, things start to get weird. Now, curiously, this is the threshold that a number of other papers have found in their own algorithms that weren't machine learning to use as a threshold for confirmed planets or not in the Kepler satellite for anyone watching. There's probably no link there, but curious nonetheless. Um, you'll also notice that rather than just collapsing off past this level, we end up with a huge scatter. So some of these really low signal to noise transits actually come out very well, which is quite odd and quite useful because these are the interesting Earth-like ones. The smaller the planet, the lower the signal to noise. Um, some of them fail miserably. Now, <laughs> for all the real candidates, which again we expect to not be planets, you can see that there's a, a sort of bump. But aside from that, frankly, it's not that signal to noise dependent. There's just a lot more of them at low signal to noise because it's very easy to misinterpret something as a candidate when the signal's not that strong. But if it is that strong, it's usually something else, quite obviously and quite quickly. Now, the point of this I said at the start was to initially rank these things. So if you started at the top of this plot and worked your way down, you might get through some quite nice signals very quickly, which is what we were trying to do. We can also look into different features, different dependencies and so on. So here I've plotted the signal-to-noise again on the x-axis against um, the statistic extracted from that self-organizing map on the y. Um, so naught is not like a planet, one is very much like a planet. And you can see that there's a huge correlation going on. So this is what's driving quite a lot of that random forest. Things at high signal to noise, almost always, because the gray points don't have anything in them, gray bins don't have any points in them, um, come out with nice planet like signals. This is just for the injected planets, I should say. So everything that's not yellow here is wrong. I mean, the model got it wrong. Now, at low signal to noise, it depends entirely on our statistics. So sometimes it gets a nice shape and it comes out well, sometimes it doesn't get a nice shape and it comes out badly. So this tells us quite a lot because we can point out that the shape is, as well as being the most important feature in the random forest, also dictating almost exactly what comes out of it. Now, that's quite interesting because shapes have very known biases one way or another in these transits. You remember right at the start, I pointed a, let's get a whiteboard pen out. Like we had a nice sort of U shape like this that came with one and we had a sort of somewhat narrower V shape thing that came out like that. And typically these are planets and these are not one way or another. And that's a lot of what this random forest is using, but not all. It's all of what that self-organizing map was using. The problem is, is that if a planet crosses its star with a slightly weird line, so if it comes in, say, down here, we call it a grazing planet because it doesn't completely cover the stellar surface. Move out of the way for anyone watching there. And that produces a transit that looks remarkably like this, which you'll notice is quite similar to that, and hence there's a problem. So one thing this model is almost certainly doing is completely ignoring any planets like this that are grazing planets. But that doesn't come out in the numbers because they're relatively rare. So there's a lot of things that can go on here and tricks that can catch you out if you're not careful. And if you were trying to use this for statistics and populations, you could be easily convinced that you were getting 98% success on everything when really you're not, probably. And this is one example. You can also get stars that look like this if they're quite small stars or one of the stars is very big because it's the size difference that tends to give you the difference. So purely by being able to plot all these plots, we've worked out that there's probably an issue there that we might not otherwise have seen, and that's quite useful. Um, another option is in validation. We can compare it to some candidates we already have. 
known ones that were picked out by I or followed up by other methods. And if I plot the cumulative frequency plot for all of the, um, all of the candidates, it's this blue line. If I plot it for the ones that we pre-selected already, it drops down now here. And the ones that are really high priority and we're following up quite actively and sometimes they're real planets is the green one. And you can see immediately that we're improving every time. The further down towards the right this goes, the more, well, the better planets these are. Allowing that these orange lines aren't all actually planets, they're just being followed up and they might not be, that gets even more allowable. So we can validate it on known ones that we have and it tends to perform quite well, at least in ranking them. I've talked a little bit about some hidden issues, which we have here, and I'm going to go into. One test we did do on this is to simulate lots of different kinds of false positive types, which are what all these axes here are, and try and test it out on those. So we're using a different test set now at this point. We can inject different kinds of false positive and see how it performs on them. So not only have we not separated off a part of the test set, we've actually created different options to see what happens to them. So it gets a little bit uh, issuous in some ways, but mostly very powerful. And you can see that certain classes of false positive are really strongly mixed with planets. So these are the quite difficult ones. That's a background transiting planet, which is still a planet in some cases, but it's something you want to not misinterpret. Things get complicated. This one, however, is a background stellar binary that's quite shallow and mixing up in one way. And so you find purely that because they're not very well represented in the input training sets, there are certain classes of false positive and difficulties that don't get classified very well at all and don't come up in the numbers. So stuff can be hidden. <laughs> And if you were to point at one of, our, one of our candidates, say, and trust the output from the random forest and say, yeah, this says it's 99.89% likely to be a planet. That's our score from the random forest. Brilliant. It's a planet. We'll forget about it. You would probably be wrong. <laughs> and to take another case on that, if I take the top 10 output real candidates from the random forest, um, nicely, we'd already picked out eight of those 10 for follow-up, which shows that it's working quite well as it should be in picking out the same things we would pick out. But five of those 10 were also shown to actually be false positives with further data that we could take later that wasn't accessible to the random forest. So you need to be very careful about the sort of interpretations that go on here. And while it can be very useful for ranking candidates and saving you time, at the moment it's not good enough for picking out the actual planets and just walking away and taking that as your result. The reason I stress that is because the outputs tend to give you the impression that it might be <laughs> in terms of these measurement scores you can get, and that's quite dangerous. Um, to overview that one, we're getting scores up to 98%, and in terms of ranking, that's fantastic. It saves us a hell of a lot of time. Very, very useful. And we can, you know, if someone gets tired looking at 3,000 light curves, they can just look at the top 300, and they'll probably see all the interesting ones. So you've done quite a good job there. Um, in terms of trusting them for fully automation, that's what I'm trying to highlight, and you're not there, we're not there yet. Um, another example is the Shalloui and Vandenberg paper, which was a nice collaboration between Google and some astronomers. Um, that tried a neural net to do basically the same thing on a different data set. And they get similar 98%-ish results, like very high results, but using a separate test, like I was talking about, a validation using different kinds of false positive, they find one of the types of false positive, 65% of them they think are planets. So again, there are complications going on, and hidden difficult elements of the data. Now, if I want to look at the other example that I was talking about, um, that previous one was a telescope based on the ground. I'm now going to talk about one based in space, so the characteristics of the data change very much. And very nice, very nicely. This is the Kepler telescope. Many of you may have heard about it, either in the media or work or so on and so forth. It's a one meter telescope. It's been up for several years now. It's operating in a kind of second mode called K2 that I'm not going to get into. But part of the telescope failed and they did some very clever, clever science in making it stabilize itself based off the wind from the sun and the solar photons. That works quite well. But anyway, we're going to talk about the original mission, which was four years long, observed 150,000 stars with very, very precise photometry, accurate to 20 parts per million in the best cases. Not always that in some others. It observed one region on the sky and just stayed there pointing at it for four years. That's, uh, you can't really see with the contrast, but there are different <laughs> CCDs here, and that's the full moon for comparison on the sort of sky. So a nice little big chunk of sky, nice big chunk of sky. Um, with four years of data and very precise measurements of the stellar brightness. Now, this was primarily used for planets and designed to find Earth-like planets. It's also useful for a huge number of other things. You can measure the stars pulsating and get their parameters out of that, something called astroseismology. You can measure variable stars in it. You can look at for flares, where stars get suddenly brighter. You can do a huge number of auxiliary star, um, science with the stars themselves. Testing on Kepler, which I want to talk about, 
has very different characteristics. So you've got much better signal to noise because the data is more accurate, um, which means that most of the signals you're looking at are now astrophysical, rather than a huge mix of noise from the instruments or the sky, which is what we saw in the ground-based survey. Now we have a lot of astrophysical signals, but some of them will be stars, some of them will be planets. Some of them might be um, strange combinations of very low-mass stars that look a little bit like planets and are still interesting but aren't, but very different. We also have more actual planets. Now that histogram I showed at the start, where it's going up massively and the transit element of that is a huge part of it, most of those come from Kepler. So there's 3,500 planets confirmed now. The Kepler sample has about 2,200 of those. So we have something that becomes more like a reasonable training set we can start to explore with. We also have um, 1,800 false positives that are apparently confirmed as false positives. And so, again, it's not hundreds of thousands or millions, but it's enough that we can start to use machine learning and look at it. Um, so the focus here is rather than identifying good candidates, which was the practical element for the NGTS survey, is to try and identify which of these are confirmed and which are false positives and just test whether we can make the method work. So should we have a signal that we're very confident is actually a good candidate, can we go one step beyond that and say this is really a planet or not? There are, really usefully for this project, so we didn't have to do very much work at all, 150-odd um, features available on the NASA Exoplanet Archive online, which have already been extracted from these light curves and used for similar projects. We cut that down to about 33 after removing ones that were less important than random features or were correlated with other ones. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that as we've got these confirmed planets and false positives, Almost all of these were confirmed into one or the other by these statistical methods, so there's no extra data taken on them, which means they've got the Kepler data, they've done something statistically, and they've said, right, we've, measured, we've looked at this area of the galaxy, we've said there's this many stars in this area. The chance that this is caused by one of these stars blending with the other one is so-and-so, we can actually get a number. And we have a shape that mixes with this. Our models fit this shape better for this than the other, the stellar models. And you can combine all that data and you can say, right, so statistically there's a 99 point something ch percent chance this is a planet. Are we going to cross 99 point probably 8? <laughs> that if yes, it's a confirmed planet. And this is how the majority of planets that we know have been confirmed. Now, this is very good when you can't afford to take extra data on 2,000 particular planets, and some of them are far too small for that data to tell you anything anyway but it has its risks. So there have been cases where planets confirmed like these. Um, let me think. So one kind of them, very large planets, there were only a few tens confirmed this way and someone checked a few of them and at least three of them weren't when you got more data. So the, the statistics that you get out probably aren't actually particularly exact in some cases. Or to be more fair to the method, there are implicit assumptions or explicit assumptions that they stated which are broken more frequently than people might like to think. Um, the other problem, and this is another paper that came out recently, is that when you have very shallow signals done this way, sometimes they still come out as confirmed planets. But this method assumes, or the method that was used to get these assumes, that every signal that it sees comes from an astrophysical set of, set of options. So either a planet, a binary, an eclipsing binary, certain, a few other things like that. There's a very limited five or six different sets of models, and it chooses between them. It doesn't allow for anything outside of that, and it's not included in the numbers. When you have very shallow planets, you can get huge numbers of signals that just come from the instrument itself or the star or various other things, and none of those are included in these numbers. And it means that quite a few of those planets might not actually be planets. <laughs> so I've probably set up now, before going into how I use this set to test out various different machine learning methods, I've probably just convinced you that it's almost worthless to use. But that's not true. I mean, <laughs> some of them won't be planets, but there's a, com a complication there that I wanted to highlight before getting into it. It's also a point that when you see a lot of these talks talking about how many planets we have confirmed, not every confirmed planet is equal. <laughs> many of them are not nearly as uh, well confirmed as others. But anyway, using this data set, what can we do? We can look at the problem itself and see how machine learning reacts to it in different ways. We can try and fully automate it and see if we can actually get statistically accurate posterior probabilities for this, um, in line with these statistical methods, but with a different and independent method. To do that, we tried using well, 11 different methods with a range of different complexity, ranging through different kinds of random forests, boosted forests, um, support vector machines, different sorts of clustering things, some simple neural nets. There's not a deep neural net in there because we couldn't get the time, basically. But other people have tried that, and it works similarly. We measured these using different AUC scores and various other things. And there's some in really interesting points that come out of this table, which I'll start going through. Firstly, they all work really well including some very, very simple methods. I mean, that's a raw decision tree, one decision tree, 
which is not a very powerful machine learning option at all when you get right down to it. Um, interestingly also, I want to highlight this QDA and LDA. So that's linear discriminant analysis and quadratic discriminant analysis. And by the name, you can tell that QDA is more complicated than LDA, right? It's quadratic as opposed to linear. There's more parameters. It has more options for fitting things. It should almost always do better. The fact that it doesn't tells you something very interesting about this data set, which is that actually it doesn't support very complicated decision making. So, which <laughs> then highlights, so why are these ones doing so well up to 99% for the random forest we got? Um, and I'll get to that in a second. So already we're starting to see things coming out of the data set. If I use the random forest, um, the features that it saw and highlight which ones are more important, the most important one came out again is the transit shape. Remember everything I was saying before about that? Various other things come out. So this one is to do with whether it has a secondary eclipse, basically. Um, these ones are certain effects of the camera, ghosts that you see on the CCD that can mimic other effects. Something about how deep the transit is and how um, strong the signal is. Centroiding is to do with whether you see the target on the CCD move as you see an eclipse from the transit, which tells you that it's blending, basically, without to get into it too much. But if you see a strong centroid shift, it's probably a false positive. Um, so they're all quite important. Things seem to be working out very well. That transit shape, um, if I do the same thing with the self-organizing map as I did to the ground-based data, you see a really strong dependence between false positives and confirmed based on the transit shape. And again, the confirmed ones look like these nice U's, and the false positives look like these strong V's, and it really gives you a strong indication. But again, we're probably still biased to the same issues that came up before. We can investigate this data in another way. If I take... Um, something called a multidimensional projection. So you take all the data in these, this 33 feature space that you have, take the distances between every point, and shrink it down dimension by dimension while minimizing the stress on that web of distances. <laughs> the best way I've come out with saying it. You can flatten it to two dimensions, even though you started with 33, and then visualize it, which is very nice. And this gives us, um, what do we have? Uh, yep, so blue is planets, red is, well, Blue to red is the probability out of one of the random forests. The shapes show you what they actually were. So the circles are planets, the triangles are false positives. They are all mostly the right shape for the color. Some of them are not. <laughs> You'll also note that some things like this, that's a false positive that was classified by the random forest as a false positive. But it's, there's no justification for that, right? I mean, it's right out in the wrong area of the feature space. And that's a sign that it was overfitting. So this data set, aside from being very simple in terms of those linear options working very well, and you can see that because these clusters basically have a nice dividing line between the two options. That's what that comes out as. Um, it's also quite vulnerable to overfitting if you let it because you have these scatter of things that come out into the wrong areas of space. That red triangle down there should in no way be classified as a false positive. I mean, the machine has no information that should tell it that. So there is some overfitting going on. And that's why... If I go back to this plot, these two perform a couple of percent better than the selection of very nice, very simple options. So there's something that comes out of that as well, and some other things to be wary of. But what this is saying is that on the current set, we can get to 96, 97%, and any more than that is probably overfitting. So we have come up with a kind of intrinsic limit, at least until we add more information. Um, one thing, and I'll add this shortly because we're coming up to the end of the talk, that we wanted to try on this is to add uncertainties into our predictions because we haven't got enough information that this is coming out. We want to see whether there's a chance of getting an uncertainty on a prediction, which would be very useful for us. And for that, we turn to another one, which is the Gaussian process classifier. <laughs> Running out of time to explain those, but they allow you to control how, control how complicated the decision space gets to be depending on what inputs you can put in. And that was the key thing. They also naturally produce uncertainties. And I'll leave it to there for now. Um, and it comes out with about the same sort of scores, but it's not overconfident where it shouldn't be, which is very useful. Um, lastly then, are the outputs of that actually planets? Did we manage to separate the confirmed and false positive and come out with the real planets in a nicely automated way? Um, one of the ways of looking at that is to see what input data you've given it and whether that's actually strong enough to do that separation, regardless of what the output scores are telling you. And in this case, we've passed it a variety of different options, which mostly are designed to tell whether something's a false positive or not. And so what that immediately tells you is that probably the things that are said as false positives are actually false positives, and you can use it in that sense. What it doesn't tell you is whether the planets are actually planets, which is another problem. Um, in terms of turning that into actual posterior probabilities, I can compare the outputs from that Gaussian process classifier to the statistical methods I was talking about and say whether they come out with the same probabilities in the same locations. 
And that produces this plot, which, for anyone paying attention, you'll note that the ideal state you want here is a nice diagonal line between 0 and 1. So why did I show you that, <laughs> rather than pretending we didn't do it, <laughs> or similar so on? Um, the main thing is that the vast majority of objects in here are actually clustered up in the, two cor in the corners that you want them to be. So this actually does work for 98% of things, as I said. And the, um, the y-axis probabilities were used as the baseline for picking which ones are confirmed and false positive. So there's connection here. It should, if it doesn't work, something's gone very wrong. Um, what this actually tells you is that both of these methods, the statistical ones and the ones I was trying to develop, are very confident when they make a call. So everything clusters around the outside of the box. That also tells you that in some cases they disagree horribly. And these, the color coding is the error from the Gaussian process. And that error doesn't really have anything to do about whether they disagree or not. It's just to do with where the Gaussian process did it. So there's two conclusions you can make from that. One is that one of them is horribly wrong. The other one is that both of them are probably wrong. And I think the, uh, the key one is that when they disagree, you should be very careful about your classifications, which I think is the way forward with this. If they both agree, you've got two independent methods agreeing. And that's quite useful in another sense. Um, to quickly zoom in on the two cases where they both confidently disagree, <laughs> which are these options, you can see that there's a few handful of things in both of these cases, and they're frankly quite interesting objects. <laughs> I don't have time to get into them, but the Gaussian process here is absolutely convinced that that's a planet, whereas the other thing is absolutely convinced it's a false positive, to the level of you know three sort of sigma, depending on how you measure these things. Um, so with that slightly um, oblique conclusion, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I think the key conclusions from this are that for this exoplanet detection, these machine learning methods are very effective on the surface, and they're very effective at ranking candidates to save you time in that sense. What there is is a significant risk of being either overconfident with your outcomes or of overfitting the data if you're not very careful. And this takes a lot of validation, and it's something very, very um, concerning to watch out for. Um, as I said, already good for ranking candidates and for perhaps for excluding false positives, but not quite yet there yet for actually automating dete automatically detecting planets. And there are ways forward to do that, using either additional data from Gaia, um, some new methods I want to try out, some sort of Bayesian neural net that's naturally more probabilistic, perhaps could work out with something. But that's where it's got to for now, and that's where I'll stop for questions. Thank you very much, Dave. Amazing. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thanks. Uh, I just wonder, um, when you put different features together uh, for input uh, for machine learning, um, I, I guess it's very different types of uh, measures you, you put together, like uh, pictures or maybe uh, like different sorts of quantification, um, quantification they're almost always, of the data. Um, and there are always, always floats or numbers. You don't tend to give it direct right, pictures. Right, but the distributions but are very different. I mean, it, mm. all, the, all your features, they have different nature, sort of, they yes. come from different distributions. Yeah. In some cases, they're binary, for example. Just right. Sort of like, so yeah. how, how do you deal with this? How do you sort of uh, con uh, convert them to a common space? Um, mostly because the random forest is very good at this. So you can allow for, you know, in a random forest, the decision trees choose in each flow to maximize information. That choice can work with, for example, binary data or float data. Or it depends a little bit on the random forest you use, but it's very versatile to different kinds of input data. I think I don't do it, but I think you can actually pass it, say, classification data and numerical data in the same go, and it will work. So mostly that's an effect of the method, which is just very versatile and part of the reason we went down that route. So. So very interesting. Uh, you you show this table where you have all the uh, AUCs for the uh, different methods. Mm -hmm. uh, so how how what was that measured on? Was that validation performance or was... was mm -hmm. um, okay, so it's done slightly differently for each of the two case studies I showed you. Yeah. So in the NGTS case, that is mostly cross-validation. So you leave um, blocks of a few hundred out just to save time <laughs> and train on the others. Um, in the other case, we tried cross-validation and a sort of separate test set. I think that, that table was done with a separate test set that was cut out from the data. And then a threshold of 0.5 on the probabilities to give you an, uh, a precision and recall. So, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so you said um, you're looking forward to including uh, Gaia data into your analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but so I work for a spectroscopic survey and we observe a lot of stars that are also going to be observed by TESS or mm -hmm. already by K2. Uh, if you could write a wish list to me, what would be on that list? Um, well, there's two aspects. The first is that it covers every star observed by TESS. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the main reason we haven't, didn't incorporate much extra stuff so far into Kepler, is that you can't find a uniform set of data to cover all of the stars. And that makes it very difficult to run these methods on. And um, that's why Gaia is so great, to be honest. Um, but there are a few things. So firstly, the knowing whether the star is a giant or a dwarf is incredibly useful. Because if you see a really shallow transit on a giant star, then it's probably a star still, whereas a dwarf, not so much. Um, the temperature of the star can be useful, but less so and tends to just feed into that giant dwarf thing. Um, let me think, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, actually, no, the spe temperature, so the spectral type is going to give us an indication of how likely it is it to be a bi in a binary. And there's some prior probabilities that can come out of that. Um, blending, how close other stars are on the sky to it. Again, a good thing from Gaia. <laughs> and that's the first things that come to mind. There are probably many more. <laughs> And if you start to get really um, detailed about it, you can start to look at planet formation rates for different kinds of star and feed that into your prior probabilities, but that's possibly going too far. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, you mentioned a few times that you were interested in identifying essentially small planets in a very noisy data. Is mm -hmm. there some difference between uh, finding small planets and actually wide orbit planets, which may also which, which actually have a few, a few fewer transits, so the challenge of identifying these. Um, so on, in one way, they're very similar because it's a signal-to-noise issue. And the more transits you have, the better signal-to-noise you have. Um, in an, another sense, not quite the same, because if, if each of those transits you can individually see in the data, you can start to run different kinds of algorithms. And then, say, a Jupiter that transits twice in the entire four-year Kepler data will still be quite easy to find. Whereas an Earth that transits 50 times but still only comes up to a sort of signal to noise of four or five is probably still difficult, even if formally they might come out with the same numbers. So there's a few subtleties, but on the whole, it's basically the same problem. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you incorporate other sources of photometry in, from, in the Kepler data, because that would give you some information on things like giants versus dwarfs. Or you mean two mass colors and this kind of thing? Yeah, or um, I... I does the, is the Kepler field covered by SDSS photometry? Um, a lot of it, <laughs> I believe. But okay. again, it's trying to get every star as the trouble, because there's always some missing, and then you immediately start losing some of your sample. OK. Um, but yes, it's a good idea. And it's something I would have done if Gaia hadn't come out, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I mean, the Gaia photometry will do roughly the same thing with the, two di with the, the red and the blue photometry will give you some information mm. on that. And a lot of these surveys are based on quite bright stars, relatively. So you almost never go below 13th magnitude or uh, fainter than 13th magnitude, because you can't do further follow-up studies on them and it becomes very difficult. So a lot of the like, nice options from Gaia and the like tend to be there available for us. So that's something. Okay, let's thank Dave again.